It is just a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing a friend, a role model, an idol of mine for decades, Penny Reed. How are you doing, Penny? Awesome, awesome. Great to be with you, Howard. Penny Reed is a dental practice management coach, professional speaker, and author of the book, Growing Your Dental Practice. It's a must read. Penny was recruited by her dentist to run his growing dental practice in 1992 and began her career as a dental consultant in 94. She has been designated by Dentistry Today as one of the prestigious leaders in dental consulting from 2007 to 2017. She is a member of the Academy of Dental Management Consultants, the Speaking and Consulting Network, and is an ASCA member of the American Association of Dental Office Managers. She coaches dentists and their teams and has spoken to dental groups nationally for over two decades. On a personal note, Penny is a major Disney fan and is always plotting her next Disney trip on her, or dental retreat near one of the parks, which explains why um, this weekend um, the um, the AADOM, the American Academy of Dental Office Managers, had a two-day seminar right here in Phoenix. Yes. Yes. And uh, your lecture was called Dental Metrics and the Wizard of Oz. Is the Wizard of Oz, that's not quite Disney? It's not quite Disney, but it's uh, it's a story. And uh, it's always an honor to get to speak at ADOM. I spoke last for them 10 years ago in Minneapolis, and that group is growing like crazy. Um, ADOM? ADOM is, yeah, the American Association of Dental Office Managers. And why do you think it's growing like crazy? I think because having been an office manager, and and especially at the time in 92, I was one of the few office managers that had a business degree. I had been in management with Walmart. Uh, so I understood what it took to run a business, but I didn't understand what it took to run a dental practice. So there was no place to go. Uh, I remember asking my dentist, well, te- you know, do you have any books? You know, is there any place? I mean, if the internet had been invented yet, we didn't have it. So he handed me a big, I think it was a Perio textbook. That didn't really help, right? So uh, we didn't really have any resources. And I... The ADOM group is just amazing, all the resources they have, um, and that they can come together and learn these things and share with others that have similar uh, challenges and issues. It was, it was brilliant that Heather Colicchio put it together. I, I wish I'd done it. <laughs> we, we, we've had Heather on the show. I'm a big, huge fan of hers. I think what she's done, she had me speak uh, in San Diego. Um, mm-hmm. She's just amazing. And um, every dentist I know that told his office manager you go get your fellowship Mm -hmm. in the american academy of dental office manager your fade on Mm -hmm. and they said it was totally worth their return on investment in fact i even did a monthly howard speaks column on Mm -hmm. it so big big promoter of her well and i recommend every client of mine that their office manager join which by the way i know we'll get to some things at the end of the session Anybody that's listening that is an office manager or doctors, if you're listening and uh, you're thinking about ADOM for your office manager, my email, super easy, penny at pennyread.com. I know it'll uh, be probably at the end of the information. I actually have a referral code that I can give to those office managers that makes their first year's dues like minimal. But it is a fantastic organization, uh, webinars, great resources. For and them. if you say Howard sent you, they'll deny your application. Yes, yes. But uh, so 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 back to your title, Dental Metrics and the Wizard of Oz. Well, where'd the Wizard of Oz? I, I love the Wizard of Oz. I was born and raised in Kansas. That's yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I, I love it too. And so what happened was they asked me to speak on knowing your numbers, right? Which I enjoy talking about that. And when you're talking with a practice directly about their numbers, they're interested in the numbers. When you're talking about numbers in general, after a while, I mean, because you know, you talk about numbers people's eyes may tend to roll back in their heads. So when they said, send in your program descriptor, I looked at it and I was like, my course descriptor sounds boring. And and they said, make it exciting and engaging. And so in my mind, when you think about the Wizard of Oz, uh, we all think about all the the positive stuff first, right? The the beautiful, colorful munchkin land, uh, Dorothy, all the neat parts. But that was really a scary movie. I mean, if you think about it, that's probably one of the most disturbing children's stories out there. Well, do you know the meaning of the movie? Um, Well, I I may not know the meaning of the movie as you know the meaning of the movie, so so you tell me. Well, when I got my MBA at Arizona State Mm -hmm. University, um, the PhD economist was explaining to us that back in the day, um, um, you know, it was was just modern that you could Mm -hmm. um, badmouth a president. Right. Like the guy who wrote Puff the Magic Dragon, Mm -hmm. when the king found out that was about him, he was quartered. Where they get four horses mm-hmm. tied, arm mm-hmm. legs, snap the horse, mm-hmm. pulled apart. 
Um, nobody ever was brave enough to say anything to a U.S. president for the first century. And so you had this, um, um, you had the Northeast manufacturing, the Tin mm-hmm. Man, and you had the farmers, um, the, um, the Scarecrow. Okay. And you had the Congress, the Cowardly Lion, and the farmers wanted deflation. Uh, no, no, the Northeastern manufacturers wanted deflation mm-hmm. so to help their exports, mm-hmm. but it would kill the farmers trying to pay down their debt. So the Northeast wanted to take, the, the gold supply was fixed. Being on the gold standard took away all your tools like we have today with the money supply with mm-hmm. the Federal Reserve. So we were stuck on the gold standard. So the Northeast wanted to take the silver and dump it in the gold and deflate the money, lower the dollar, print more dollars, help exports. And so the yellow brick road um, in the in the book, she had silver slippers. Correct. But in the movie, red. right? But in the movie, they didn't show up on black and white, so they had to go to Ruby, yeah. which was so dumb. Um, she had silver slippers. She's walking that silver. She's walking the gold brick all the way to Emerald City, which was the greenback, mm-hmm. which every state had its own currency until um, the Civil War. Lincoln didn't know how to pay for the Civil War, so he mandated that states had to roll their currency into the greenback. Emerald City, the greenback, so he could just print money counterfeit to pay for all all that deal, and um, it was just a, so it was a, an intellectual movie mm-hmm. book, and all the intellectuals read it, and um, all the intellectuals knew the meaning of it, and the president, and the Congress knew the meaning of it, and it was it was a uh, letting them know what the people thought. Isn't that something? You know what I'm thinking? Like as you're telling me all of this, do you sleep? <laughs> you, pro- you probably are one of the most read wow. uh, people that I've ever talked to. No, it's- you know what? It's a habit. I, 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 I just don't read fiction. That's yeah. all it is. I don't yeah. read fiction and I don't watch TV. Yeah. Well, you, know? you can definitely get a lot done like yeah. that for sure. So when, so when you think about the story part of it, right? Because people learn or, and are more engaged, at least I am, if there's some sort of story behind something or, or I lose interest. So I, I thought, well, what can we do to engage them? So... Most of the time, what prevents us from learning and tracking the numbers, sometimes it's fear, right? We're afraid of what we're going to find, um, or we're afraid maybe we're not smart enough, uh, or if we do see something as an office manager or even as a, a business partner in a dental practice, we may not have the courage to point out what that is. It, 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 all of a sudden, we bring that up, now we've got to deal with it. Uh, so often what happens is it's the flying monkeys. That was how I tied a lot of that in, right? So it's like, what are some of the flying monkeys that you have in your practice? I have a doctor that doesn't want to know the numbers. My doctor doesn't want to know the numbers. Can you help me with that? I was like, we need to talk about that after. Uh, You know, how how do we prevent broken and canceled appointments? You know, it's, it's like they really got it that one of the reasons they don't track the numbers, I said, you will say, we don't have, what do you think they say? We don't have blank to track the numbers. Time. Time. People, and yeah. right. And so part of it was also being intentional, being sure that we're staying on the yellow brick road. So from from that perspective of the program, it was more of an analogy and you know, and keeping them engaged and, and they had a lot of fun and most people came up after and they said, This was one of the best programs I've ever heard on numbers because I was able to stay involved and, and it, it was a blast. It was probably the most fun I've ever had presenting the numbers because we, we got to play with it. It was a lot of fun. Well, you, uh, and a follow up on the uh, Wizard of Oz, um, the mo- favorite play I ever saw in my life was Wicked. Did mm. you see that play? I haven't seen Wicked. So, so the, the Wizard of Oz starts with these characters. Mm-hmm. So this guy went back and said, well, where'd they come from? So he developed the characters. And you know when when you do when you go to like um, say um, some movie you've already seen mm-hmm. and they do a play you know the whole plot but this was so fun because you know the Wizard of Oz but you don't know where they care it was it was the most amazing play I'd ever been to and at the end it was the only play I've ever been to where the whole room jumped to their feet wow and applause for I mean like I've 10 heard I, I love the music so that's, oh that's on my bucket list to see it was just crazy um, you know back back to the numbers. Um, you know, uh, my, my book was People, Time, and Money. I, I think HR is everything. Mm-hmm. And I I always think that um, when I study um, neural anatomy, they're pretty convinced that pretty much everybody has the same brain. I mean, if you dissected 100 dolphins, 100 ants, 100 chimpanzees, mm-hmm. and 100 humans, unless you got a tumor or something, right. we, all, we all got the same iPhone. Mm-hmm. So it's just, um, um, you know, they say, well, this girl's a genius. I went and watched a genius violinist. 
And she was amazing, but she played four hours a day since she was age four. Right. I don't want to play the violin four hours a day. So she's not a genius. She was heavily interested in the violin. And when people say to me they suck in math or they, they hate numbers, mm -hmm. they're just not interested in it. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're interested in something four hours a day, every day your whole life, you're going to be a genius in it. Absolutely. And, and like, um, you know, they tell us the two smartest people in the world were um, um, Sir Isaac Newton in mm -hmm. 1687, the principles of calculus, and then, and then um, um, Einstein in 21 with uh, relativity. But again, it, those, if you study those two people, they're, they were freaks. I mean, I mean, um, gosh darn, Sir Isaac Newton took all the money from his book right. and invested all in tulips, the tulip bulb deal, mm -hmm. which is the first equivalent of investing in gold. I mean, there's no difference in investing in tulips or gold right. and lost all his money, but he's the smartest guy in the world. Einstein married his first cousin, and when he got his Nobel Prize money, he gave it all to her if she would change her name and go away and not tell anybody that he had married his first cousin. The, but what, why were they so genius? Because who the hell else was studying physics in 1687 and sure. 1921? So sure. since they were the only one interested in it, mm -hmm. they're a genius. Mm -hmm. But if you know all the baseball scores, uh, going back to you know um, Babe Ruth, mm -hmm. then you're you're just a dummy. You're right. just a Walmart or right. you know you're just a beer drinking dummy. Dummy. Right. Because if you're interested in something that everyone's interested in, there's no value. That is why my in my lesson on HR, which is I think you know if you own a football team, you just want the best players. Absolutely. You have a dental office. That's why I, I look back at my 30 years. Every time I hired a bookkeeper, mm -hmm. you know the girl coming in to work the, in healthcare right. wanted big bucks. But the little bookkeeper, she just wanted like twelve. Mm -hmm. But the but the the well, I got ten years experience in dentistry. I want twenty three dollars an hour or twenty seven dollars an hour. And then and then I'd say, well, what what practice management system you been on? Dentrix. How long you been on it? Ten years. Do you know it good? Good, good. That's great. How many reports does it run? No, no idea. idea. No idea. And then you just start asking her basic report. Mm -hmm. And then the girl I hired from Chase Bank. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. So so. Taking a bookkeeper or a girl from Chase Bank and teaching her what a felling crown root canal is was easy. Absolutely. Taking a girl that had no interest in numbers and teaching her numbers was impossible. Right, right. It's And I think you've hit upon, and, and in the last part of the presentation, w when we recapped the numbers and, and I said, take a look at, at this particular slide because what it talked about was being intentional. Right, and, and planning and having that time. I said, what you know about the numbers is important. So having the self-discipline and the focus is what's most important. And then also involving the team, because what office managers tend to do, most of them, especially if they kind of were promoted from within, they know how to do everything in the office and they're great at it. So they become professional firefighters instead of learning how to empower the other team members. So. Uh, when, when I think about uh, what, what had me write this book and, and put these systems together, it was a passion to provide a resource on how to grow a practice. Uh, and you and I have done a, a previous podcast. There's a blueprint in there to grow a practice by 25%. So I believe today with Dental Town, uh, the conferences now that are available, the books that are available, there is no shortage of information on how to do things. Now that doesn't mean that that information is not important, but it used to be you couldn't find it, right? It was like trying to look for a needle in a haystack. So when I really think about what we need most in dentistry and, and where we're heading, you know, a thought hit me and, and that's that practice management as we know it is dead, right? I mean, it, it's, it's back in the early 90s, we were so hungry for information, right? It was like, well, if we can just find how to do this. Now I watch dentists, and I know you and I have talked about this before, dentists, office managers in a constant, I'll just call it like spinning or twirling. Okay, well, I need to go take this course. Uh, you know, I need to learn how to do this procedure. We need to add Botox and Juvederm. We need a Cirec. We need a CAD CAN. We need E4D. All those things are great. But if you don't have a culture and an environment in place where people will utilize those things uh, and, and that places value on the patients over the we're smarter than everybody else, you struggle. And then you go from one consultant to another. I mean, I, sometimes I'm office's first consultant. Sometimes I'm their 15th. 
And boy, you know, when you're the 15th, depending on where they are, like if they're in the top, you're like, okay, this is a group that can take what they learn, they can apply it, and this is going to be so awesome. If I'm the 15th consultant and I look and this practice is struggling, it's not that they don't know what to do. And, and that's really like the heart of my message now. It's like, okay, I'm about to be 50. And, and, and what is it that I really want to help practices with? I love practice management. So, you know, to say that it's dead, you could say, okay, Penny, is it really? But without a high level of coaching, it is. And I don't mean, oh, hey, hire me or, you know, find, somebody, find another coach that you like better, hire them. I do believe you need a coach. I have a coach. What dentists and office managers, team leaders really have to have is they have to learn how to coach. They may not want to, right? But if you can't get people to do what you want them to do, not because you pound your fist on the table and say, you know, do it this way or there's the door. If you can't get that buy-in, if, if they don't know what your expectations are, they're never going to be able to, it's the, the um, sustainability, right? They'll do something for a little while and then 30 days later they quit. So if you feel like you're having to babysit your team, that's, a, that's an issue of a bigger uh, problem, right? That, that's not the issue. The system's not the issue. It's the environment that's the issue. So I, I'm curious what your thoughts are about that and, and what you think of when you hear the word culture. Well, I'm, 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 it was very profound what you said about these office managers or firefighters because they've done everything. Mm -hmm. They're cross trained everything. And I, I would say whenever I see... Um, an office manager, uh, they're answering the phone, they're scheduling patients, they're greeting patients, they're putting out a fire, they're doing something. They're working in their business. Mm -hmm. And I don't see them sitting in their private office going long, restructuring, any planning. I mean, I, one of the most classic books in the world was The E-Myth. Oh, absolutely. Because here's mom and dad. They had a restaurant in Parsons, Kansas for 40 years. They were born in that town. They went to church there. Their kids went to high school there, everything there. And McDonald's comes in, sets up right next to them, and they're out of business in 90 days. Mm -hmm. And everybody would know that just doesn't seem right. That's a big deal to corporate dentistry. Right. You know, I mean, this is a family-owned restaurant, mm -hmm. and the deal is they work so hard making a hamburger fry and a Coke, nobody ever thought, you know, why does it take an hour to get a freaking hamburger fry and a yeah. Coke? And so here's McDonald's, here's Ray Kroc, here's these guys, and the movie The Founder was, I think, the best movie I've seen in years. Um, what was that guy's name? Keating. Uh, was it Michael Keaton? Michael Keaton. Mm -hmm. Michael Keaton. Mm -hmm. God, he was good, man. Because I met Ray Kroc. My dad had oh, nine man. restaurants and um, four states. And um, he, uh, man, God, that was the greatest movie. Because it was all systems. Mm -hmm. And he had these franchisees that say, well, we want to add pizza. I mean, imagine if McDonald's sales were going down. Mm -hmm. And their answer was, well, we can't make money on a hamburger, fry, and a Coke, so... We're going to add um, microwave burritos and a pizza. You'd say, are you out of your mind? Look at car companies. Look, look at uh, so many of these car companies realize um, that have sold off their high-end cars. I mean, I mean, it used to be old Ford had some, um, the, the nicest, uh, uh, what, what was the, um, um, Jaguar oh, yeah. in the UK. And mm -hmm. they, they all have these high-end cars. And they realize it was such a just, they, they don't make any money on a Jaguar. They don't make any money on Botox. Mm -hmm. They don't make any money on TMJ. They don't make any money adding all this bullshit. They sit there, you, you're doing a cleaning exam, x-rays, fillings, crowns, mm -hmm. and there's 10,000 dentists who do a million a year and take home 350 that don't do molar endo, pull wisdom teeth, place implants, have a CAD cam, have mm -hmm. a CIRAC. Mm -hmm. What they have is they have their damn business in order. Absolutely. And th and what the car companies found out is, um, you know, um, all their hot engineers wanted to go play in Jaguar and they'd be having a meeting and half of it would be on this Jaguar that was like 1% of revenue. Like, like I'll meet someone who goes to a, 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 one of these big uh, um, occlusion places. Mm -hmm. You know, um, once a, once a, for a, for a weekend, six times, and I'll say, well, what what percent of your practice is TMJ? Number one, they don't know, and number two, you know, it's one percent. Sure. And um, I, you know, how many people I know that have flown all around the world to learn about sleep apnea? It's still oh. one percent. And so my deal is, I want you to be passionate. If sleep apnea and occlusion and TMJ, if that's your passion. Amazing. You know, you know what you should do with the passion? You should first be rich. Mm -hmm. So if your passion is camping, you can buy a camper and a boat. And if your passion is traveling, you have, so get your damn house in order. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, and if you can't make money in dentistry on cleanings, exams, x-rays, fillings, and crowns, and simple endo, simple extractions, if you can't do a million a year on the basics. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, I I look at that little girl who's up there in the conductor in the orchestra. I mean, if she needs a cello, she's not going to go to the Cello Institute and get her fellowship in the Academy of Cellos. Mm -hmm. She'll just find someone. I mean, these big boys like that, they'll they'll go find a... uh, They don't want to learn how to play some plants. They'll go find a peridonist in the next county. Uh, they'll stack them all up on a Friday, pay them 50-50, mm-hmm. and he'll come in there for, you know, patient furs, their records are here. He'll come in there on, on a Friday once a month and place eight implants for eight grand, and Absolutely. the dentist will make four grand while mm-hmm. he's sitting on the golf course. Um, I can, um, so, you know, I, I just I just think that, you know, um, restaurants are the most brutal business out oh, there. Oh, absolutely. It's about an 80% yeah. two-year failure rate. Mm-hmm. And no one's ever analyzed a restaurant and say, well, the problem with your restaurant is you didn't have a bunch of alphabet stuff behind your name and you didn't have fettuccine Alfredo. Right. It was basically, you didn't know your numbers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You and know? you didn't have great service. And it's funny that you mentioned, because, you know, all those services are great. I mean, treatment of sleep apnea, the TMJ. It's not that the services aren't great, but if you look at the reason behind, you know, it's probably the 80-20 rule. What motivates most dentists to do that is is they see it as, you know, I, I call it it's like the quick, quick fix, right? Like the crack hit. Uh, so I can go do that. I'll make a whole bunch more money and it'll be easier, right? I mean, that's that's what they're being sold by a lot of these companies it's and then they go bullet. yeah they go it's and they take bullet. the course and one of my top producing most profitable clients who by the way doesn't do any of that stuff that you just talked about right, right. just bread and butter solid knows how to treat people you know we were talking and he said you know what we were talking about something being easy and he said what worthwhile in business or in life is easy and i thought that's one of the most brilliant things that i've ever heard anybody say and it's from a dentist who you know he, he hasn't done any of the you know the smoke and mirrors kind of stuff he's just a basic smart business man and great at relationships mm-hmm. and so so when I look at because it does frustrate me if I work with somebody and I teach them these things it's not it's not an ego thing for me that, that they may not do what I teach them to do it's painful for me. It's like watching your patient who they come in and you're talking to them. It's like, oh my goodness, you know, you've got a floss. Take a look at this. You know, you're watching them let their teeth, rock, you know, just right out of their head, right? And they're thinking, well, if I just use a different toothpaste or if I use this mouthwash, I won't have to floss. Well, that basic fundamental piece of it, when it comes down to the culture and you're talking about having their house in order, even if they know their numbers, with the volume now that a lot of practices are doing, and you can probably remember when you when your practice was smaller to when the business gets bigger, when it's smaller, the culture part's easy, right? right? I mean, oh, if you've yeah. got four operatories and you can see every single room and you hear every conversation that's going on, you've got your finger on the pulse of what's happening. So now you've got 18 operatories, three other dentists. Everybody's wearing a radio. Half of your team's, the phone's being answered upstairs. The phone's being answered off-site. So that's where, and, and when I think about culture, and it's pretty exciting because I'm now being asked to talk about it, uh, which which is by, uh, by dental associations, because most of the time, it's like, what is that? So scientifically, you culture something in a Petri dish, right? I mean, we can all relate to that. You think you have strep throat, they put the three-foot-long Q-tip in the back of your throat, and you think you're going to die, and then they they put it in the dish, and they look to see what grows, right, in the environment. So in a healthy culture, uh, you could think, all right, well, you could see like a beautiful plant or something growing in that culture. In a culture where where it's not healthy, where there's more dysfunction present, you know, like to give a visual, it's almost like there's these amoeba, you know, germy bacteria growing in there. So if you could take that analogy and put that in a business how much more does it help you to know how to schedule better or what your uh, overhead is or uh, how the phones are being answered? If there's that disease present, you just keep working harder and harder, right? You go to one seminar after another. You add that much more of the different treatment modalities to your business when the true issue is you haven't defined for your team, however big the organization is, what the beliefs, values, and behaviors are 
that are appropriate. And I'm not talking about a policy. I know businesses need a policy manual. I'm not talking about that part. I'm talking about the owner saying, here's how we want you to treat people, right? Here's, here's what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. These are the values that are important. This is why I want you to answer the phone this way. This is why I loved when you were telling me when the when the older ladies come in your practice, you not only like hug them and kiss them on the cheek, right? Like you're like kissing them on the mouth. You know, it's it's a if they're I, over I, eighty. Yeah, hell yeah, yeah, they're your girlfriend. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, so it, it's it's that part of it, and then everything else grows from that. But what happens is, and Howard, I'm here to tell you, I've made every mistake probably known in the book as an office manager, as a consultant, um, and those are the best teachers, right? It's the clients that you come in and you sense that the culture piece is wrong, but they're like, you know, we'll worry about that later. Help me with the systems. Well, what do you think winds up happening, right? And then I wind up kicking myself. We go system, system, systems, and then the next thing you know, you're in the office and you realize that you've got a partnership that's about to explode, right? Uh, you know, the doctors are at each other's throats. They haven't even defined how they're going to work together. Uh, and, and it just flows down to the team. So um, defining the culture is part of it. Then you've got to share what the expectation is. You actually, you've got to overshare it. Um, we were talking about Disney and oh my goodness, I, I love Disney. I have a friend that's a Disney Institute facilitator. And so uh, we were talking, and when, when they hire new people on, it doesn't matter what their role is uh, as, a, as a cast member. They go through something called traditions, and, and it's two or three days where they talk about the, the history and the culture and, and how things are going to be. So you're indoctrinated into that from the get-go. Uh, then, after every so often, I don't know if it's every two years, every three years, you go back through traditions. So they're, they're keeping that in the forefront. And it's not just because I'm a, I mean, I am a Disney nut, but, but part of what works so well with that organization, and it's got flaws, right? Just like every other business has some flaws, is they have managed to replicate it in different cities, different countries. And as a, a customer, a guest, you still have the same experience. So you look at these dental offices, right? Well, oh, we're doing great in this one office. Let's open a second one. Oh, the second one work, works pretty well. Like, you know, if we were thinking about you, uh, well, Howard, you could work a couple of days here, a couple of days there. So you are the driver of the culture primarily, right? So you're in both places. Well, now we, we do location three, location four. Right around location three, especially location four, if that culture isn't in place, location three and four, have you ever seen the movie Multiplicity with Michael Keaton? Where he clones himself. I hit it. Yeah, I did yeah, not. It, 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 it's probably a B movie. It's hilarious. Like, it's just one of those, like, dumb movies that you should watch. So, there's not enough of him to Michael go Michael Keaton, the guy that was in The Founder? I, I believe. Well, it's Michael Keaton, so I think that's yeah, who was in The Founder. Yeah, so, yeah. so, he clones himself because he needs to spend more. His marriage is bad. He clones himself. And it works great because one of them's at home doing all the honeydews and the other one is at work. Well, the clone decides to clone himself. So the third clone is a little bit off. Well, by the time you get to the fourth clone, I mean, like, he's he's special. Like, he's nothing like the first one. But I, it's a goofy analogy, but I watch it happen. These guys, it's like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, we're going to do that whole entrepreneurial thing. And there's nothing wrong with having multiple locations. But you not only need to have that first location in order, you've got to have everything in place so that if Howard's not there... Right. If you're that dynamic driver, entrepreneurial person, how do these other offices replicate what's going on? Right. So it's it's just something I'm very passionate about because these doctors come to me and often it's not because they're planning to have multiple locations. You, you know what happens. They have them and they're struggling and they're telling me, you know what, these two are having to, to support the other two. And I haven't drawn a paycheck in six months. So that's one of the things that I'm really passionate about now is, okay, you know, how do we get on the rooftops and shout out this message that, yes, you do need the practice management, but most of you already know you've got it available, right? You, you go on Dental Town, you read Howard's books, you read Growing Your Dental Business, but it's creating the environment and having a team of people that's coachable. Yeah, the um, you know, so the doctor has one rent mortgage equipment. Mm -hmm. 
So he decides the best way to deal with his overhead is to have two rent right. mortgage equipment. And then he's spending, so he's only spending 32 hours a week out of 168 and one. That's only 19% of the week. Mm -hmm. Now he cuts that in half. So now mm -hmm. he's down to 8% in two locations. But the sweet spot today of going bankrupt is between location three and four. Oh yeah. Because when you're right there, you can keep that Doberman pincher mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. But by the time you get to three, that Doberman pincher is now a Tyrannosaurus Rex and it, it takes you out. And, and the expanding, I think, is more to do with uh, ego because I'll go into dental schools and they'll, I'll say, to, and I mean, I, I, I've um, heard this several times, say, well, what is your goal in dentistry? I'd like to own four offices. It's like, where does four even come from? I mean, what if, if you, you know, it's not even a number. Like if you, right. like if an office, the average office is 750, why don't you say I want one office that does 3 million? Mm -hmm. What, I mean, where, where the hell did what that What does the other from? location mean? Yeah, right. Well, and, and, right. and it was funny because the McDonald's brothers, uh, Richard and McDonald, and, you know, they, they were trying to franchise it. A lot, a lot of the, the people in uh, watched the movie The Founder thought, well, he was a bad guy because he stole the idea from McDonald's. Dude, if Ray Kroc didn't do what he did, you would never heard of McDonald's. Right. And um, so they, they can't execute. Everybody thinks... Um, it's the idea, um, you know, I mean, I mean, look at McDonald's, it's on the corner. Mm -hmm. they, have, they sell a hamburger, fry, and a Coke, they have a drive through Right. You know, duh. I mean, do you walk in there and need a Ouija board and, you know, to, to figure out what they're doing? No. You just would never be able to execute like that. Mm -hmm. And so the dentist can't execute on a cleaning exam, a filling, a crown. I mean, I mean, I mean you know, I always talk about the funnel. I mean, look at it. I just saw some really interesting data. Only 5% of the people that land on a dentist website convert and call. Wow. So, so 20 people have to land on your website to call. The dentist doesn't know that number. Mm -hmm. he, he's learning sleep apnea and bone right. grafting. So 5%, 20 people have to land on the website for 5%, one out of 20 to call. Three people have to call your front desk before your piece of furniture can schedule one to come in. Right. And you don't track that. And you don't record the calls, mm -hmm. and you don't you don't you don't execute on that. Mm -hmm. You go into McDonald's. That sixteen year old has a uniform, an aim tag, a hat, and before she could work one hour at McDonald's, she had to go home and do online video training mm -hmm. and pass a test. And some of those don't even get through that. Same with Subway, right. but but the front desk furniture piece, no training. Oh, absolutely. So so twenty to land on the website for one to call, mm -hmm. three to call before one to come in. And then three people have to come in with a cavity before one gets treatment. So for the country, it's 38%. We're talking about decay. Yeah. We're not talking about veneers mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. bleaching and bonding mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And then that is what it takes to have the average dental office doing 750, taking home 174, mm -hmm. which has been going down every single Absolutely. year. 2005, it was, it was uh, um, 211,000. Mm -hmm. And it's gone down about 3,800 a year for a decade to 174. And then all that funnel goes into a bucket, which is leaking. Right. So by the time you get to 5,000 charts, 4,000 of them are gone. Mm -hmm. And you walk in and you say, um, doctor, how many patients, you know, my, my definition of an active patient is who's scheduled for a damn patient. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, they'll, I'll say, how many people are active patients scheduled for something, a cleaning exam, mm -hmm. an x-ray? Mm -hmm. So that leaky bucket, the, the hygienist saw eight people today and she only scheduled six for a recall. She just lost 20% of your practice mm -hmm. yesterday, mm -hmm. and you're off to Jamaica to learn how to place an implant. Right. When I, I could get the periodontist in Tucson, I could get every periodontist and oral surgeon in Tucson to come up to Phoenix and place my damn implants. Right. You just lost 20% of your hygiene practice with Amy Lou yesterday. And so they just, uh, so, so they wonder why corporate dentistry is mm -hmm. kicking their ass. Well, and, and we talked about this a little bit in my talk yesterday. I said, most of your competition is not outside of your four walls. It's in your office, right? If every day you competed with yourself to do your best, right, to answer the phone to the best of your ability, to engage the patient, it to uh, talk to them about what they need. And boy, I mean, I, I could talk all day about this part. We think that the intraoral camera I mean, my clients, they, they look at me, it's kind of like, oh, here mom goes again on a rant about what, whatever. Every office has them, and they don't use them. And, and this is where 
uh, when I talk about case acceptance, and, and I have a funnel that I use in my programs because it's like, okay, marketing dollars, telephone rings, appointment scheduled, get the patient in, do the comprehensive evaluation, right? You know, we're doing the whole song and dance, and then, it, you know, we, we get them on the schedule, and then the drip comes out the bottom, which is actually the work that we get done, right? So, so when we have them in there, also when we have them on the phone, but especially when we have them in there, our case presentation needs to be more like Disney. Again, you can tell I'm just a big kid, right? I'm always going to be a big kid. More like Disney, less like the Internal Revenue Service. I want you to think about that. Disney's known for engagement, right? The whole involving you in the experience. They're not just telling you a story. You're part of the story. They're showing you the story. So the case presentation is everything from you know, when you come in, let's say you're not a new patient, right? We might take the photos on the new patients or, well, we take a picture if there's something broken, right? Or there's something wrong. Well, why not involve that patient, give them more of a why, give them more value. When they sit in the chair, they need to be looking at what's going on in their mouth. We don't need to be telling them about it. And, and we're starting to play a game now in my offices when I'm there. It's like, okay, here's the game. It's like Simon says, I'm going to be walking around and watching you can't talk to a patient about a tooth unless they're looking at a picture. And I don't mean an x-ray. I'm here to tell you, I still look at x-rays, Howard, and half the time I'm like, I mean, I'm not a dental trained. I've never been an assistant. I've never been a hygienist. So I see things very much from the patient's perspective. So when we're talking about the treatment, we point to it. When that patient comes back and they're seated in the chair and there's topical on, there should be a picture on that screen where we say, hey, Howard, Here's the tooth that we're working on today. And, and you know what I hear happen? There's patients in the chair. You know, even there was a little old lady I heard in an office a week or so ago, and she looked up there and she goes, oh, I hope that's the tooth we're working on today. And they're like, yes, ma'am, it is, right? So how much more value does she have for what she's having done? Because she was re-engaged with that when she got there. What's next? That picture better be up before they leave the operatory. And if I were to work in a dental office, I would never want to make a financial arrangement or have a financial discussion without the photos. But what do most offices do? We are so in love with our digital x-rays, right? And so the patient's looking at it. They don't want to look stupid. But so they're looking at you. You might as well be speaking a language that they don't understand. And they're nodding that they understand. Then we go over this treatment plan that has all these procedure codes, which to them, remember the old hee haw, BR549, or, you know, you could think IRS form, you know, 1040 easy. They're overwhelmed and they're confused. So when people buy, they need to be in a feel-good mode, not in a, I have no idea what I'm looking at. Uh, or, you know, as I like to joke, when you say the term prophylaxis, most people think you're talking about something that you can buy on an aisle in Walgreens. They're not take, you know, thinking about getting their teeth Yeah, clean. Yeah, and then they get their entrance by a Trojan. Right. Nice right. name. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to call Trojan <laughs> and check on your prophylaxis. Yeah, but, but it's, it's the whole, we, we keep doing the same thing over and over again, right, to quote Einstein. And so if, if we really, you know, when the doctor comes in the room, the pictures need to be up. It, it, they shouldn't have to ask. It should be something that happens automatically. But what they tell me is, oh, we do that. And so I'm like, oh, okay, great. So the next day we go back and look and we pull up every patient and I'm like, how many patients did we take intraoral photos of? Mark that on the schedule. If you know you showed that patient a picture, mark that on the schedule. If you sent the patient home with the, pic with the pictures, and I don't mean on photo paper, right? Just print them in color on paper. Uh, it, check a box. We are watching people. That we're just herding them in and out and, and then thinking, okay, if I want to make more money, I've got the answers outside my office. No, it's really not. It's in there. And we're so distracted by everything else that's going on, we're not paying attention. But you can't get people to do those things if they're not coachable. And, and that's where it all comes down to. It's like, okay, and I watch doctors. Well, you know, I've told Susie 17 times this is how I want it done. I'm like, okay, well, have you asked Susie? And I know this may sound dumb. So, Susie, let's take a look at this. We've had this conversation. Let's take a couple of steps back. Are you willing to do it that way? You know, are you, I mean, 
Why not ask the question? Because if all you're getting is resistance, there's something behind that. What it really comes down to is I don't care if Susie's a millennial or, you know, a, a baby boomer or whatever age she is, right? Take people out of that box where we've said, oh, well, she's going to do this because she's in that box. Just ask her if she's willing to do it. And if she says she is, just say, okay, let's go over this expectation. Tell me how you understand it. And then what is it going to take to make it change? If not, you're babysitting and firefighting her. And that's all we do, right? We come in every day and we run, 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 and we're, we're babysitting and micromanaging when the true issue is Susie may be capable, but is she coachable? And I don't care how capable you are. If you are not coachable, you're not going to get results. So can you tell I get all fired up about that? I love your passion. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you use so many profound things. Um, you know, when you talk about intro, you know, if, if a pilot, if the United States Airlines was successful 99.99% of the time, mm -hmm. we'd have four plane wrecks a day. They have to be 99.9999. Wow. They need 4.9s. Mm -hmm. You can't get, I mean, I mean, and this doctor can't get his hygienist to reschedule 25%. If it was pilots, that means one-fourth of all the planes at Southwest mm -hmm. Airlines would crash every mm -hmm. day mm -hmm. if it was ran by a dentist. And, and um, they, they, they don't have a system. I mean, just everything. Like, like back to Southwest Airlines, every plane is a 737. Mm -hmm. You go in a dental office and, and the dentist says, uh, oh, you have, a, you have a cavity here. Uh, God, it only take five minutes to fill it. Let's do it right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we can't because every room's different. At Southwest Airlines, every plane is a 737. Mm -hmm. But here, we're going to have to move the patient because this is my room. Right. And we're going to have to move it to another room. Well, dude, logistics, execution. You want to mm -hmm. learn bone grafting? Why is this operatory not capable to do an occlusal composite? And why can't the hygienist go start in another room? Absolutely. And, and then they say, well, we don't have enough rooms. Mm -hmm. Well, so you have enough money to buy a CAD cam and, and a water lace laser and mm -hmm. fly to Dominican Republic with Aaron Gard, and you don't have a, an operatory? Yeah. You don't have another room? Doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and then and that's why I always tell them, and I'm not just um, 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 promoting you since you're here, but I've always told them the number one investment is not a laser, a CAD cam, it's a in-office consultant to get your house in order. Mm -hmm. Get poised for growth. Absolutely. Fix your prototype. And then boys have toys. You might want to have a Ferrari, mm -hmm. a laser, a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, 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 whatever your, floats your boat, but get your damn house in order. And that, that, that intro camera. I mean, when I bought my first intro camera, it was from Patterson. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was $38,000 for that, that um, um, Fuji cam. It was Did it Fuji look like cam. R2-D2? It, like it, was, a, it was, a, refri it was yeah. a refrigerator. Okay. But you know what? Everybody was waiting for the price to come down. Mm -hmm. And 100% of my homies that, that bought it here in, in Ahwatukee in Phoenix, not one single one regretted it. Because by the time everyone waited for the price to come down to ten thousand five years later, mm -hmm. we'd already sold another million dollars of dentistry. Right. You know, so so they um, they 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 threw away a million dollars mm -hmm. waiting for the price to come down. And and now and now the, I paid thirty thousand for the first one. What's it the DigiDoc oh, cost? I, I'm I'm not sure about DigiDoc. Um, I know that's a lower cost. There's another company that I bumped into at Chicago Midwinter called Mouthwatch. So like mouthwash, yeah. but mouthwatch. Nice. And I think theirs are like literally two hundred and ninety five bucks a piece. Uh, they're a teledentistry company. They're they have support for a year. And here's the here's the funny part. Are they as nice as the ten thousand dollar camera? Uh, well no, right? <laughs> But they get the job done. So I've even had offices say, um, not not even with that camera, but about one that they got from Amazon. They're like, yeah, it's okay, but the picture's a little bit blurry. That's the same picture that that patient looked at, one of those same pictures, and said, are we fixing that tooth today? So we're not doing this for us. We're doing it for the patient because we've got to inspire in them, create in them an eager want for what we have to do. So often I hear patients only want what their insurance is going to pay, right? Maybe a fraction of them want that, right? But we're not working on helping them have a want to. Um, a few years back, uh, I guess maybe I thought I didn't have enough um, 
a dental business to do for a while, I thought I want to be a Dale Carnegie trainer. And that's one of the best books out there, right? How to Win Friends and Influence People. So I went through that whole training process and became certified to do that. And, and really, I mean, he was like the, the godfather of motivation and leadership. And one of his principles is to create in the other person an eager want. So when we think about leadership, right, it's like, I want to learn to be a better leader so that people will do what I freaking tell them to do, right? Isn't that what a lot of people think, right? It's not that I need to change me. I need to change them. But when you get on the path of leadership, if somebody doesn't want something, we haven't, we haven't uh, awakened that urge in them. What better to do that than the camera and to, and to ask them what it is that they want? So if in offices, when it, you know, going back to that culture and the beliefs, I, I've watched this happen it, with, with clients of mine, um, and I call it a tale of two practices, right, instead of a tale of two cities. Similar demographics, similar training, um, uh, oral conscious sedation, uh, sedation training, implant training, uh, similar uh, income levels. There's not that much different in their areas, right? And yet one is kicking it, doing the conscious sedation, implants, marketing that. They're just busier in general, right? Just blowing the doors off. The other one also certified to do the conscious sedation implants, they hardly do any of it, right? This one client says, we can't, you know, we're, we're so busy. Like, we're, we haven't had growth like this in years. This other office says, people in our area don't want that. They don't want implants. They don't want the conscious sedation. Well, it, the, the procedures that I'm talking about, that's just an example. What it comes back to is the whole belief system. If we believe that patients deserve the best that dentistry has to offer, if we believe that we want them to leave with that next appointment, even the whole, and again, I'm not a dentist, I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes, but why don't we schedule that? Oh yeah, that can wait until you come in for your next cleaning. Um, what all can happen to distract that patient from coming in for that next cleaning? Like they may even forget they have that small single surface restoration, right? So now they, they're a few months uh, late getting in for that cleaning and what was a small restoration now needs a root canal. You know, so I'm not trying to say that we scare people, but we're just so, eh, everything's important for them, right? We, we've got to uh, watch out not only for the minimizing language, but using that camera ought to be up there in the priority list, in my opinion, right beneath being sure that the instruments and the room is sterilized. Like it's got to go from being something that we'll do if we have time to this is a must do. And it's a must do because we believe that our patients deserve to see what's going on in their mouth or they can't make the best choices. Yeah, you know, I can go into it's always self limiting beliefs. Like, mm -hmm. Like um, right now, a quarter of Americans, um, they, they believe that fluoridation in the water is toxic. Oh, yeah. You're not going to change your mind. A quarter of Americans believe that vaccines mm -hmm. are, are toxic. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, it's like our climate change. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, who cares? I mean, um, this is 2017. Go back 100 years. 17 of the first 100 years, or 1900, 1917, when, when the flu season came out, the Spanish mm -hmm. influenza, 5% of America died. So if you don't want a flu shot, I don't even give a shit. Yeah. But but it's all self-limiting beliefs. Um, like every, I can go into every zip code of the 147 largest metros in America, mm -hmm. where half of America lives, and the other half lives in 19,008 towns. And I can go into any one of those zip codes in urban America, and he'll tell me, well, they, my patients only want what the what the insurance pay. Okay. And then I can do two double checks. I can have care credit come in because mm -hmm. care credit isn't looking for any new patients because every dentist has tried them at least once. And they'll go on there and they'll say, okay, in your zip code, here's how much, here's every single office that uses care credit mm -hmm. and here's how much they finance. And you're financing $387 a year mm -hmm. uh, uh, last month. Mm -hmm. and, and the median was 4,000. Mm -hmm. And then the, here's this guy over here that's near a hundred. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and what's that near a hundred? It's so um, important because 80% of Americans are lifetime. At one time or another, will buy the average new car. Mm -hmm. And the average new car is probably a Ford Escort, a Ford Taurus, 30 grand. Mm -hmm. Yet 95% of all dentists have never done a $30,000 treatment plan one time in their life. 
because patients will only buy what the insurance will cover. Right. So I'll say, so so you did three hundred and eighty seven dollars last month. The meeting in your zip code was like five to ten grand. Mm-hmm. And here's a guy over here who did a hundred because mm-hmm. once a week he does a full mouth rehab. Mm-hmm. And, and and he just wants to they never want to look at the man in the mirror and say, Damn, I, I suck at selling. Right. I can't present treatment. And the self limiting bleeds. They'll sit they'll, they'll sit there and tell the patient, Well, you know, why don't we do the, the two fillings on this side? Mm-hmm. And then two weeks later, come back, and we'll do the two fillings on this side. And then two more weeks, we'll do the two. And then right next door to him is an oral surgeon, where his entire life, he numbs up all four quads and takes all four out at the same time. Right. Well, I can't. I don't want to numb both sides of the mouth, because you might bite your tongue. Okay, one stupid thought. Right. One stupid thought. For 40 years, I mean, as you you and I are busy. Would you mm-hmm. want to go to the dentist four times for oh, four fillings? No. Or go in there and just get her done? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I'll um, have it all done. And, and, and back to that cello deal, you know, they'll say, well, I need to go learn how to do a oral conscious sedation. Yeah, you wouldn't want to just have a board certified MD anesthesiologist right. come in your office and knock out. They, they, every time their house is not in order, uh, they're like a chef right. that needs a new recipe. Right, right. We think oh, we need my restaurant is going menu. bankrupt. Yeah. I need to learn how to make lasagna. Yeah. No, 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 no. Enchiladas. No, 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 no. Fettuccine. Yeah. No, you know, they, yeah. they're just no, you, chasing yeah. all this yeah. crazy stuff. You need to learn stuff. how to make your, your, uh, your customers feel like when they come to your office, they get treated better. Then they get treated any, anywhere else. You know, when they, when they come to your restaurant. Yeah, and you, even, you and even, the, even that, they, they call it the new patient experience. Mm-hmm. Because the the new patient is the heroin addiction. Oh, yeah. The fact that 80% don't come back. I mean, when someone says the new patient experience, I'm like, dude, it should be the patient every, experience. Every experience. It's the patient experience. And the fact that you say the new patient, mm-hmm. and it's funny, when you look at the Fortune 500, no, how could anybody want a new patient? I mean, United, mm-hmm. has someone not flown United? Is United saying we need new patients? I mean, Chase... Amazon, right. Walmart. It's I mean, all about the repeat engagement. Yeah, do you know anybody every, who hasn't been to Walmart, Costco, mm-hmm. Southwest Airlines, or Chase Bank once? Right. I, you, you're coming up on 50. I'm coming up on 55. Nobody in the professional Fortune 500 wants a new customer. They're all trying to figure out, Doc, you have 5,000 customers. Mm-hmm. 4,000 have not come back in the last 24 months, but only 687 are actually scheduled for anything. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and it's like... they. What is you know, that telling you? Yeah, what yeah. does that tell you? So, so, so even, but, even at... Oh, go ahead. But, but go ahead. I, I want to get back to your amazing book, Growing Your Dental Business. Mm-hmm. You, you talk about um, the five um, drivers. The five keys to growing yeah, your dental business. Yeah, the five keys to mm-hmm. drivers. Talk, talk, do you want to talk about that? Um, all right. So, so the five keys to growing your dental business are... Uh, increasing the new patients, right? They're also increasing the active patients, which I love how you define an active patient. How I define it in the book and what I look for is I'm looking to see how many different people have been in, like how many unique individuals in the last two years and we measure that every single month and, and to be sure that it's growing and not shrinking and 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 in the average dental office mm-hmm. um that's what everybody does and that's a great metric yeah. but in the average dental office, about half of those are actually scheduled for something right so if, if about two you know mm-hmm. if about two thousand have been in the last 24 months mm-hmm. about a thousand will be actually mm-hmm. scheduled for something and that is the low hanging fruit. Absolutely. I mean, why are you? I mean, why would you worry about China, Russia, Istanbul, mm-hmm. and Brazil? Mm-hmm. You got a thousand people that have seen you in the flesh mm-hmm. in the last two years. Why aren't they scheduled for a cleaning? Absolutely. An exam, Absolutely. And, and I think a lot of it is again because we think that they don't have the money. And the bottom line of it is, they don't. They don't want to do it bad enough to spend the money. Right. It comes down to that that whole engagement and the want to. So one of the other keys is to increase, which ties into active patients, increase the percentage of our practice if we're, you know, pediatric or general that we're seeing on a regular basis in hygiene. And we've got to get away from the whole come in for your free cleaning or your due for a cleaning. And it's got to be the doc, you know, it takes 30 seconds to let that individual patient know why it's important that you see them twice a year. You know, not because the toothpaste company said or your insurance pays for it. It's you've made a significant investment in your mouth. And, and yeah, you are prone to decay. You are definitely somebody you need to keep those appointments instead of, oh, yeah, we need to get you in. Well, what's the why behind that, right? The patient is, you know, has no idea. 
Um, so efficiency is another huge piece, increasing the efficiency. And, and you were talking earlier about the employee, that, that the new hire that says, oh yes, I know Dentrix. Most offices learn enough about the practice management software to survive, right? It's like, what do we need to do just to get through the day? There is no continuous, constant, and never-ending improvement. How can we get more efficient with this, more, more efficient with the charting, save some steps here? We're always looking at ske- you know, the schedule, the schedule. Well, you know what? The slower that everybody is, the longer it takes to process a patient from the time they call or walk in the door until they go. So the efficiency piece. And then last, the fifth key is, is the case acceptance. And one of the tools, it, it, measuring case acceptance, my husband's in sales, and we talk about this all the time. You can, you can doctor up the numbers enough on case acceptance that you don't even really know what the percentage is, right? But you still need to look at it and track it. So in an office, if you're presenting an extraction, if you're presenting that same extraction with a bridge, or that same extraction with uh, an implant and a crown, and the patient accepts the extraction. On one hand, I presented a $200 treatment and $200 was accepted, right? So it looks like my case acceptance is 100%. Well, is it really, right? So, I mean, it's like we can look at that and go, oh, you know, well, our case acceptance is awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. At, at presenting the bare minimum of what anybody would want, right? So, so there's that part of it to where we'll never, you know, no matter how you slice it, there's always going to be a different way to look at it. But along the lines of what you're talking about, what I'm starting to have clients work on, because this is, this is one of these problems that just drives me bananas that I want to find a better way to measure, is I'm having my offices look at on their reports, what did we treatment plan today? Like, so for today, everything that was treatment planned, and then run another report for the next 90 days, because here, here's my thought process. If they haven't scheduled for the next 90 days, what's the reality that they're going to ever schedule? Now, I don't know that there's a stat on that, but I imagine that within 90 days, it's just a downhill slope. So they're, they're coming up with what's the total that was treatment planned, and then they've got that other number that shows what we worked in today and what was treatment planned. And they're measuring that every day, right? So it's showing them this is how much we treatment planned and then this is what we scheduled. So everything else walked out the door and didn't have a a phase or or something that went with it to create that awareness because we don't know, right? We're looking at the numbers and we're thinking the answer is I'm going to go to this course, which CE courses are great, right? Or I'm going to go get certified to do this, that, or the other when they actually have all the resources. It, this is a thought that comes to my mind. If, if you had a mouse in your studio, right, which you don't. I saw like a gecko or something outside. But if you had a mouse in your house, do you need a, a digital remote mousetrap? I mean, yes, people are always talking about building a better mousetrap. What, what does it take to kill that mouse? A 99 cent or $2 mousetrap? from Safeway, right? So we keep thinking that, well, if we've got this other, that's gonna solve the problem. And I love how you talk about it. You get your basics in order. And, and then once you do, going back to the culture piece, the biggest mistake that I see offices make is like they don't take any time for training, not even going to CE, right, to, to enhance their skills. But they come back to the office and when they're not seeing patients, they might have one short team meeting every other week or a month, but there is no practicing that takes place. So I'll give you an example of something that I learned from the Dale Carnegie organization that was super powerful, is this is a 12-week program. You bring people in from all walks of life, McDonald's shift supervisors, uh, uh, CEOs, um, executives from FedEx, you know, all walks of life. We teach them something and then immediately they practice it immediately they practice it. Or, you know, in the office we say, oh, we're gonna role play. And then, right, everybody wants to pass out or they suddenly need to go to the bathroom or clean the bathroom, right? Nobody wants to practice that. So there's two parts of that. One is we say practice makes perfect, right? But here's what I want you to think about. If you don't intentionally practice something while you, the doctor, right? If you've got the expectation of how you want it to happen, it's like, well, 
I don't want to have them practice that. It makes me uncomfortable. So guess what? Every day they're practicing that in real time with your patients and they're creating permanent habits. So practice doesn't necessarily make perfect. Practice makes permanent. So if you don't invest, again, this is the, the whole culture piece, that time with your team. But again, I hear it from the dental business owners. I don't have time, right? I, I've got to be chair side. I've got to be doing this. I've got to be doing that. Heaven forbid, right? And I want my doctors to have time off, right? I mean, you and I, when, when I interviewed you for my podcast, we talked about what's the secret to not being burned out, right? And you're talking about you got to have life balance, right? You know, the, the yoga and the things outside of the office, but if we don't make time to train our team, and yes, that some of that means having a consultant come in, but the other part of it is, are we working on that stuff, uh, you know, when the consultant isn't there? If not, unless you have a Penny Reed or a Howard Ferran or fill in the name with the, 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 the blank with the name, you will never be able to get it done without someone like us. And, and, and I think that's, the, that's one of my missions is I don't only want to teach you what to do and teach you how to coach. I want it to be where, you know what, you guys want to work with me, right? But you don't need to work with me in order to be successful. You've been able to adopt these habits. So, so the five keys to growing your dental business are hugely important. But if we don't have those drivers of culture, which you know, the, the last was you got to coach and you've got to coach often. And, and for the doctors, whether you feel like you're a leader or not, you know, you've got to be willing to give people feedback. I don't mean be ugly to them, but if your office manager or your administrator isn't answering the phone the right way, every day that goes by that nobody coaches her on that, what does she think? She thinks she's doing a good job, right? So if you do sit down, as I love you talk about when the what this, this uh, earth rotates around the sun every 365 days, so we think that we need to give a review, right? Or the team members think they need raises. If you don't tell me about my performance but once a year, my thought is I must be doing okay, right? Because you haven't given me any feedback. We want to hire people at the hiring process I want to know if you're coachable. And I want you to tell, you know, well, well, Howard, tell me about that. What, what do you think makes you coachable? How do you accept feedback? I, I, want, I want to hear what they think about that. And I want to say, you know what, we've got a great practice. We think you're going to love it here. And all of us, from the business owners to the office manager to the rest of the team, one of the most important things here is that we are always learning and that we're always open to feedback Right? We don't want to deliver feedback in a mean way. But if we're not open to feedback, I don't care how smart you are uh, or what you know or how many different procedures you can do, your ability to get better, I mean, it's, you just cut it off. That was profound. Um, yeah, I mean, that was so profound. Um, back, back to um, when I am in an office that does a full mouth rehab case a week, Mm -hmm. the, the the most interesting thing is that is you know they'll they'll take a uh, the the pano is the best selling deal some 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 are now doing a CBCT but that that's just overwhelming it looks like the Hubble but they'll just sit there at a CBT and in their walnut brain they all have the same thing they say in common um, that you know to get a dollar you got to diagnose three so they're not in their diagnosing their checkbook mm -hmm. thing and Penny came up in a nineteen seventy four Dodge Dart and she's mm -hmm. eighty two years old you don't you don't know what's going on in her life mm -hmm. right her husband just died and she and and they'll sit there and say, okay, so you're missing your, your back teeth here. So that would be, uh, you know, we'd put two implants here, two implants here, and, and two bridges here. And they just, they just treatment plan ideal every single time. Every time they look at you, they just think, okay, this would be what's ideal. Okay, so, you know, you need four quadrants of cleaning, you need this, that. And then you go into the next deal, and they're, and the, and I mean, we're talking like 95%. They're just like, okay, well, what is the worst tooth? Mm -hmm. And their insurance only covers a thousand. So you came in and this one broke off. So we'll just we'll just do a crown mm -hmm. and we'll max it out and this and that. And that single single self limiting belief uh, is just just a game changer. And then there's this um, you know this this five percent this one in twenty mm -hmm. which is about the general dentist conversion rate from mm -hmm. the website to call the office. Mm -hmm. And every single patient chair side fast efficient will just tell you everything you need to do. 
-hmm. and and it's it's a full mouth tree plant. And some of my some of my friends that do that say they only like baseball. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, they only swing hit like one out of three, mm -hmm. and some are like one out of five. But these guys that are doing one case a week. They pitched it five times. Absolutely. And they're pulling everything out of their mouth and rebuilding it mm -hmm. once a week. Mm -hmm. and, and and just going back to the dental decay, I mean, um, I just don't know how you think you're a good dentist when only, just cavities, only 38% mm -hmm. of the cavities you, you fix. Mm -hmm. and, and you're all that big, and you're in the Pierre Fouchard and the Mastership yeah. and the AGD, and you went to the Pank Institute, mm -hmm. and you're a mentor at Coise. Mm -hmm. Dude, two out of three of your patients I mean, I wish you just would have moved, removed the decay and right. packed it with butter. Yeah. Because that would have been so much or bacon. better. Because yeah, bacon, bacon. Everybody likes bacon. Everybody loves bacon. <laughs> My God. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, bacon is uh, the, the greatest thing in the world. And um, only 11% of a pig is bacon. You should do and, an entire podcast on bacon. It would be fun. Oh, my God. Um, I'll come back for that. And, 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 and back to that uh, efficiency. I, I mean, um, um, back back to the pilot where he's got right. like 99.9999. They only work from checklist. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if, you know, the, the you can see the blue skies, you, you mm -hmm. got to check the weather report. You, every single thing is need point nine nine nine. There's no systems and no one follows them. Mm -hmm. And and um, you you get them on the wall, and, and then the, the embezzlement. I mean, they, they don't even have oh, their yeah. banking yeah. On, on their phone. They you, they can't even see red flags. Like, how can we never deposit cash? Mm -hmm. um, um, at the end of the day, the the hygienist cleans up a room and leaves. She doesn't have to go have a, a pilot's checklist to say I saw nine people today mm -hmm. and I rescheduled this. Um, well, and don't you think a lot of that goes back to again? It's that whole I don't have time. Right, which which you almost have to look at. Uh, you know, I have a I have two eighteen year old girls. I have an eighteen year old daughter and an eighteen year old stepdaughter. Okay, so when your kids are growing up and they they tell you I don't feel like doing that, that's what I begin to hear now when I hear I don't have time. Right, it's it's okay. So we don't have time, but if we were to make time, how would we do it? So without I don't have time to make the checklist. Right, so it's the firefighting cycle. Well. So let's, let's take 10 steps back. If Susie or if Howard, if this is the right person in that position and they don't have a clear picture of what it is that we want them to do, and this is everything that's in the picture, right? Here's what a good job looks like. Here's what it looks like when we don't do it right, right? Here's the consequence to the patient. Here's the consequence in the office. Here's how often we want it done, right? So if once we paint that clear picture, right, when I look at if I have a team member or a client or a client's team member that I feel like I've given a clear picture and they're still not getting it done, I go back, right? Ultimately, I'm accountable, right? I'm the coach. I'm the trainer. Did I show them? Did I give them all aspects of the picture? If they have the picture and it's still not happening, it's not that they didn't have the checklist. It's that they either didn't have the want to or they didn't have the why to. But who couldn't make a checklist? This whole business of we don't have time to create a checklist or, or I've watched in some of my client offices and, and I love all of my clients, but I get lit up when I go in the ones where we've got really coachable team leaders, right? And they're coming to me and they're like, okay, I want you to watch this, listen to this, and, and let me tell you this training process for our, for our new team members that come on board. And I watch her go through the whole thing and I'm like, that's awesome. Why isn't that videoed? Why do you have to, every time you have a new team member come on board, why do you have to go through that whole spiel with them every single time? You ought to have that videoed. You sit down, you say, here's what we're gonna go over. I want you to watch this. I'll be back in a few minutes. And when I come back, I want you to tell me what you learned from that. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, even they're, they're so busy. And then the other is, if they're clinical, when I go in an office, I love it when they have the walkie-talkies, right? I'm like, give me one, because I want to hear what's going on. And this happened just a couple of weeks ago. So I go in this office that's an office that just went from nine operatories to 18, right? So just imagine what happened with the overhead in that office. So the pressure is high to produce. And this, this team leader, she's the clinical director and the office manager. I mean, I just look at her by like nine o'clock that morning, it, she looks like she's been there all day, right? Somebody says, I need perio charting in room two. She's like, I'll be there. Um, I, you know, hey, uh, 
Susie, we need you in, in room four. Um, we need you upstairs. We have a question. <coughs> so what I watched her do all day was run around like a glorified extra person. And so I just said, here's why, here's why you're stressed. And then I talked to the doctors. Here's why she's not, she doesn't have a handle on the numbers. And she's not, you know, able to talk to these different people about things. It's because every time somebody calls over there for something, she's trying to set this great example and she's running and doing it. I said, her role is to be sure that everybody else is doing that. You know, it's like in room four, we need period charting. I said, you listen. Here is anybody else answering. If they don't, your role is to repeat. Can someone help Glenda in room four for perio charting? I said, if they're not available, then you go. I said, less than 10% of the time, should you be the one that's running in there, you will never be an effective leader. And so one of the things that I'm doing now that I had not done previously with these larger offices, we have more team leaders, is I'm actually holding sessions for the leadership and the dentist to talk about the culture and to learn how to coach, you know, a true coach and true empowerment is if somebody works for you and they're capable, your job is to help them do whatever that is for themselves, right? It's it's not to give them the fish, it's to teach them to fish. And you will never grow beyond whatever it is that you're doing right now if you can't do that. You're always going to have a team of people that are just sitting there and they're saying, oh, well, I would have done that if you'd have just asked me to, right? Has parenting not been one of the best teachers that you've had as far as managing people. So I had an epiphany. Uh, I asked my daughter, I was like, did you unload the dishwasher today? Like every day her job is to load or unload the dishwasher. Oh, well, you didn't ask me to. All right. So after I had my meltdown, right, like the, like the bad witch in the Wizard of Oz, um, I said, okay, let's take two steps back. Every day, this is no different, right? Every day, that's your role. It, it hit me. She only felt responsible when I made the direct order, right? But she wasn't accountable. And so again, what I see happen is one of the biggest challenges uh, in, in dentistry is the turnover. I mean, you talked about it, right? So if, if we don't have that culture in place that sets the expectations, gives the appropriate training, gives feedback often, right? If we wait till people are in trouble to start talking to them, you may as well, you can just, you don't necessarily need a revolving door. You can just put a door stop in the door and leave it open. And then you're going to bring in these other people who most of the time, I would say a lot of the hires made, if you're hiring for personality and not for the dental experience. Oh, don't even get me started on that. Most people that have dental experience, they're, they're, they're not the best employees out there. It's better, like what you talked about, to take that if, if they've got the ability to think in the coachability. But you can even put a great person, if you put a great person in a toxic environment, are they going to want to stay there? No. They're they're picking up the phone and calling me and going, uh, I'm not really sure what I got myself into. Right? And I'm like, well, you know, they don't want to lose you. We don't we don't want to lose you. We need to work on that. Yeah, and I see so many offices where they have this massive, massive, massive turnover and they got this one wicked witch mm -hmm. uh, in, in the office and it's like um and, and it's always doctor's favorite, and of you know, um, because she's Jekyll and Hyde, she mm -hmm. brings him a Starbucks and a muffin, and ah, right. yeah. and then she's a witch all day while mm -hmm. he's doing a root canal. But um, you know, we just um, started the NFL season, and um, you know, the couple they started the four preseason games, and each mm -hmm. team had about seventy-five players, and they had to trim it down to fifty. And you look at these thirty-eight coaches. And I mean, if, if you didn't catch the ball four times, you, how many how many times would you have to not catch the ball before they'd fire you and cut you? Oh, and, I mean, and you know, you'll go into an office, you'll say, okay, I want every one of these operatories a seven thirty seven. If I go into any operatory and open up drawer three, mm -hmm. it's the same in every room, and no one owns a room. And if I go in here and the hygienist, this guy needs a filling, I want to do it. Um, you got to have extra rooms because the rooms are your cost. And then you come back like a week later, a month later, six months later, and they still haven't done it mm -hmm. because Doc, they know that you just let him vent. Right. He went to a course. He listened to a podcast. Let him vent, and and he 
accepts mm -hmm. mediocrity. And, and he thinks that it'll never change. And, he, and he's a town of 5,000. And I'm like, every one of those towns of 5,000 has got a dozen small businesses that do three million a year, the mm -hmm. owner nets a million, and they found all them people in that small town. Mm -hmm. There's people that love, they're workaholics. Oh yeah. They, they just love this shit. And, and um, you know, I call it the 80 20 rule. Um, um, you know, about 20% of my employees are probably workaholics. Mm -hmm. And you can't fit, find that out in the interview. Right. But what you can do is, you know, you can't interview and process and find your A players. What you do is you get real, you, and, and, and weeding out the F's and the D's is no brainer. But what these guys can't do is they can't get rid of the C's. Because mm -hmm. if you keep getting rid of the C's, be, because how that culture works is the founder um, is in charge, the head rot, the, mm -hmm. the, the fish rots from the head down. The founder starts the culture. And then, you know, some people come and go and come and mm -hmm. go and come and go. And then someone uh, likes that culture and then they stay. And then people come and go and come and go. And then mm -hmm. someone comes and they like that culture. And then, and then eventually the founder can die. Like, like Sam Walton died. Ray Crock McDonald's mm -hmm. died. I could die. Mm -hmm. But my Lori, my Ken, mm -hmm. my Stacy, my, my, mm -hmm. my people have been there. Tom Gico, these people have been there decades. Mm -hmm. They, um, agree with the culture. Mm -hmm. And so the new people coming and going, they come and go, oh, I don't like this culture, leave. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and, and part, of, part of the culture is, you know, you, you got to be humble. You got to hustle. Mm -hmm. um, you got to be coachable. You got to have fun. You don't, um, you don't make people, I, I have my 12 deals. Ryan, will you go grab my 12 deals? You know where it is? I'm going to end that because, man, we went 16 minutes over. Uh, my gosh, uh, we, uh, we got talking we like, did. A, like a couple of schoolgirls on, on the uh, park bench. Um, <laughs> It was but here, 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 here's our culture. Our culture, which which we've had for thirty years. You're gonna. It, it's, I, I, I took it to twelve. You know, there's mm -hmm. uh, twelve, and they they say the uh, uh, the twelve apostles mm -hmm. and the the, the twelve um, zodiac, and you know, twelve is a big number. So I, I started twelve. Create a fun, positive, and professional environment. Be passionate, enthusiastic, and determined to make a difference. Be humble. Embrace and drive innovation. Follow the golden rule. Treat others like you would want to be treated. Mm -hmm. Mistakes will be made. Be accepting and are accountable and move forward. Never stop learning. Be honest and respectful. Integrity is everything. Balance life and work and be fully present in both. Strive to make everyone feel safe, valued, important. Be remarkably helpful. Create opportunities to make our customers and patients feel special. So what I do, everybody has these core values. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, um, you know, I'll actually pull it out. And I'll sit there and say, um, you know, um, you know, well, like, like, like balance life and work. Like the mm -hmm. dentist in between phone calls, in between patients, send mm -hmm. them someone up, and then he'll go call his wife or mm -hmm. check on his kid. Mm -hmm. But then he'll tell his staff they can't take personal right. phone calls. So she, the assistant can't even focus because she's wondering if your kid ever got dropped off at mm -hmm. school. And, you know, it's uh, good for the goose, good for the gander. So I like that balanced life and fully present both. Um, strive to make everyone feel safe. Well, the whole news is talking about bullying. Mm -hmm. And every dental officer, there's a deal where if you, you know, there, there's just one person, it's the office manager, mm -hmm. it's someone, and usually it's a legacy employee. Right. And she's driving all the turnover, all yeah. the stress, and, the, and all and the misery. And even the doctors are afraid of her. Yeah, yeah. and, uh, and um, be remarkably helpful. I mean, I, I don't care that those aren't your instruments. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's someone else's, we'll be helpful. Mm -hmm. Clean her damn instruments. Mm -hmm. Humble is huge. Oh, I, absolutely. I, um, hustle. Um, I, mean, I mean, I remember when I um, used to open in when I was slow, and we'd have a cancellation, and I'd always have a stack of flyers, mm -hmm. and uh, I would tell the assist I mean, it'd be Phoenix, Arizona, 118. And I'd say, hey, go stick one of these under every windshield mm -hmm. in, in the parking lot, and, I remember, and it'd be 118 degrees. And I remember one time, uh, um, uh, one came back, and I said, uh, did you do it? And you go, no. I go, what do you mean, No. I said, what, what, do you, what do you mean? She goes, Howard, you did that two weeks ago and you did it four weeks ago. There's an apartment complex, you know, a mile down the street. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought I'd go nail the apartment complex. Mm -hmm. You know, just hustling. Yeah. Hustle. Humble hustle. Mm -hmm. uh, integrity is everything. But, uh, man, we went way over. Yeah, we did. Uh, but, no, but, I uh, love these. I love these. I actually have something similar to that that's a free download in an upcoming article. Um, but but the, it's already up. So if you're... Uh, listeners, viewers want to go to www.attitudeupgrade.com. It's a list of what I call the B 
attitudes, right? Sounds like I'm playing off of the Bible. So that's not a, your, your, your website is growingyourdentalbusiness.com. Correct, correct. But, but that little free download is, it, is at attitudeupgrade.com. It's a neat little poster, right? If they want to adopt those, they can. You know, they can just print it off and hang it on their wall. But it talks about being coachable. You know, it talks about how we're going to, to interact with other people. And it's it's similar a similar vein to yours, but I love those. And and you've got to revisit them, right? You can't just type those up and put them in a book somewhere. Right. That, that needs to be gone over in your interview process, in team meetings. We need to do like a self-check. Hey, guys, how are we doing? You know, and, and you as the founder, how am I doing with the being humble, right? You know, I mean, one, one of the true hallmarks of a great leader is that if, if you were, let's say, doing something that wasn't out of humility, that it would be okay if a team member came to you, maybe didn't call you out, right, on a podcast or in front of everybody and says, hey, Howard, can I talk to you about blank, right? When this happened, you know, it kind of came across this way. And you know what? You may not care, but it, it just, it didn't necessarily seem to, to mesh with that. Thank you this for... This has been so fun. All yeah, that we went you do like for way over time. Yeah, we went way, way over time. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much, Howard. All right.